up with public comments. Anything that anybody would like to add, not on the committee. Okay, then let's just hop on into new business. Uh, the first thing on there is patron groups in Missouri Evergreen. There was some discussion back and forth in the last week or so. Um, Somehow a patron got connected in a patron group um, that they, they didn't want to be in a patron group. And so the way that that is going to have happened is somebody accidentally, when they were creating the library card, um, hit save and clone instead of just save. When we do that in Missouri Evergreen, it links those uh, patrons together, um, which is great. Um, if your library wants to group patrons together, not so great if it happen, if it happens accidentally and your library is not planning on uh, that to happen. So um, I have included in the um, agenda that went out the instructions on how to um, remedy that situation if somehow you find that you have a patron that's been linked with somebody else. Um, so this is um, Equinox's instructions to us on how to um, ungroup those um, patrons together. So I know Cass County doesn't use it. I think Jefferson County maybe does. Um, I'm not sure about that, but um, Anyway, that's um, how you would um, how you would go ahead and unlock them. Then uh, you wouldn't see share finds. You wouldn't see any of that. So questions on patron groups. Okay. Uh, the second thing on the agenda is the refresh that's coming up at Poplar Bluff. Um, on March 15th, and then we will also be having a refresh at Barry Lawrence on March 30th. Uh, there should be more information coming out, hopefully by the end of the week or at the first of the week of how, uh, the first of next week of how you would um, register for both of those um, regional trainings. Um, the last one was wonderful. I think everybody got a lot out of it. So if you are in that, that Southern part of Missouri, we would love to see um, your library represented there. Uh, there was a lot of good things covered at that um, last um, circulation refresh that was in scenic. So moving on, this is where I figure we're going to maybe have a little bit of discussion this morning, or hopefully there's been um, this week, I was out of the library for two days came back and my email <laughs> was like, it was just a lot on, on this reciprocal borrowing um, issues that people are having. And so I wanted to open this up for discussion among uh, the circulation committee, I mean, community, so that um, we get a better idea of, of where things are and what we want to do. I know, I, I believe the executive committee is going to take a look at this too, but I think they would appreciate knowing kind of what the membership um, thinks on this. So I just want to open this discussion up to anybody who would like to share. Mickey, would you like to give um, a little overview of what, what we've been thinking about this? Well, sure. Just to get things started, um, I think that um, some of you may have been um, part of conversations in the past several months about odd things happening with some of our patrons um, going uh, and doing things at libraries that maybe we didn't think they could do or should do or we want them to do. And that really is the impetus for this whole thing. I think as our consortium has grown to 60 plus members now, we've discovered that our patrons, as always, find ways to um, use the system to 
their advantage, which is good. The system is um, powerful. Um, Evergreen is a very powerful ILS. It does lots of things. It doesn't always do exactly what we want it to do. And in the case of reciprocity, that is a patron, let me define that. That means when a patron from one library walks into another library and uses their services with their uh, Missouri Evergreen card. In the case of that reciprocity, we don't always want that to happen. In fact, we put some things in place several years ago as a consortium to sort of you know, guideline that and say, well, we're going to have what's called a reciprocal agreement between member libraries. And if you want to allow a, a, a reciprocal kind of thing, you have to be a signatory to this agreement. Now, currently, there are 14 signatories to the official Missouri Evergreen Reciprocal Agreement. There's a couple of wrinkles that I want to throw your way, though, that I need you to understand. One is what we've discovered, and Diane, jump in if I if I miss something or I misrepresent this. What we've discovered is that there is not a common understanding among all of us about how that reciprocal relationship is governed by our ILS. In other words, we some of us think Missouri Evergreen, the, the software, prevents certain things from happening, and it doesn't. Some of us think that um, we can allow um, reciprocal borrowing sort of informally with neighboring um, libraries, and you can. And there is a general sense that the reciprocal agreement itself might be a little bit outdated. So those three factors taken all together has put us in a situation right now where we're sort of reevaluating the whole big picture. Um, I will be very frank and tell you that um, my understanding of this software, Missouri Evergreen, and my working with open source software over the past 20 years, this software was designed for open sharing. It was designed for all members to be able to share um, universally with each other. In other words, if I'm in Poplar Bluff, I should be able to go to North Kansas City and use my Poplar Bluff card there. Now, you know what the problem is, right? We all know what the problem is when that happens, is that we all have different guidelines and rules for checking materials out. Now, a couple things, and if I'm going too fast or if this is not making sense, stop me. A couple things. One, we've all signed on to a resource sharing agreement among each other. We, we share our resources, our items, our books, our DVDs, whatever. We share those pretty well with each other. We've worked that out. This next step is how can we share materials fairly, equitably, and still maintain our own library's rules when patrons physically walk from one library or drive from one library to another library and try to use services at a fellow um, Missouri Evergreen Library's location? That's what's reciprocal. That's what a true reciprocal is. And what we're trying to figure out is, is there a way that we can let our libraries keep their rules their fines, their preferences, their checkout times. What can we do to, to make a situation so that we do have basically a universal um, Missouri Evergreen card for patrons, but still have our member libraries retain uh, the, the rules and uh, the, the circulation principles that they need to have, either for um, that's the way the board wants it, that's the way they want it, that's the way their community wants it. And of course, we want that to be um, kept in place. So, all that was a prelude to the fact that we are discovering that a lot of things that we thought we knew about Missouri Evergreen, the ILS, are wrong. One of the things we thought we knew was that we could prevent patrons from checking things out, like at a self-check or at a desk, um, if they uh, had a foreign library card. Well, guess what? We can't. And that's the bottom line. It is not the system. The uh, software is not designed to do that. We could make it do that at great expense and great cost, but um, that is an option that we're not really putting on the table right now. Instead, what we've discovered is that there are certain kinds of global flags or rules that have not been implemented in our consortium that would simplify or at least um, it would uh, unify the rules around how an item is checked out in a reciprocal situation. Renewals is the big problem, you know, because if you check an item out at one library, renew at another with different rules, you get fines on it. Some libraries are fining, some libraries are not. There's a complexity uh, to the whole situation that we really need to investigate. So I'm going to wrap up by saying this. I would like everyone to have um, a pretty clear, common understanding of how our ILS functions, what we can do to make it function better, and what we can achieve 
ultimately to agree on a shared solution to this reciprocal borrowing issue. Okay, so I guess what I would like, um, Diane, maybe you've checked into it a little bit more. What are the parameters? What is happening actually right now when things are checked out? Like a Cass County, I walk into Scenic and check something out. What happens then? The item that you checked out will follow Scenic's circulation policies. So, um, It'll check out for two weeks, you know, have, have uh, two renewals, uh, won't be charged overdue fines if it's late. It doesn't matter that your card is a Cass County card because it was checked out at a scenic workstation. So I think, you know, everybody might be fine with that. What we had happen recently between a couple libraries is that that happened. Um, Something like that happened. I don't know. It's so confusing. So the Cass County patron checks out at Scenic. The item then will be bound by the policies that Scenic has. Then the patron goes online to his online account and renews it. The renewal defaults to Cass County because that is the patron's home library. So when he checked it out at Scenic, it was checked out for two weeks. He renews it at Cass County. It might be renewed for three weeks then if that's Cass County's policy. And maybe Cass County allows five renewals and it's gonna follow that policy now. If the patron had gone into um, the scenic branch to renew it, it would have renewed by the scenic policies. So that's one problem that we're having now. Uh, and that could be fixed by changing a setting in um, Evergreen so that the renewal would be at the same, would recognize that the renewal was happening at the same library that the original checkout was. So if the Cass County patron checked out at Scenic and then renewed it on the OPAC uh, through the um, mobile app, it would not recognize Cass County's policies. It would recognize the original checkout locations policies. That would be one way of clearing up a whole lot of mess here. The only caveat there is that some libraries use auto renewal. Mm -hmm. And if, if Cass County was using auto renewal. Which we do. Which you do, then the Cass County policies would automatically apply to that item, even though it was checked out at Scenic. And we have the setting set that uh, renewals would follow scenic policies. So that's one issue. Um, I think the fine issue can be somewhat problematic if, if between the two libraries, one library is fine free and the other library um, charges fines, um, a patron could end up with fines that they didn't realize they were getting and if I understand what, what came through last week, okay, if I go into Scenic and you're fine free, but then renew at my library, which charges fines, it's going to put fines onto the account. The original library that the item, that the place where they went to check it out cannot remove those fines and they would have to then come back to our, our you know, the original, you know, the home, the home library, library. Yeah. And deal with something that's, that wasn't checked out at their location. It's not their item. It's just their patron. Yeah. And I think that that would be something that we would have to discuss whether we wanted to void those fines, because I think this was going to, it would be a, um, a patron education thing to educate the patron. You check out some place else, those are their rules. You have to follow their rules. And we could explain that at the circulation desk. If somebody uses a self check machine, then there's not going to be any, any interaction with the patron. But the patrons would have to understand that when you check out someplace else, 
you have to follow that library's checkout policies. And it wouldn't, it, fines is a big thing, of course, because we all guard our money, but <laughs> uh, the circulation periods and everything could be different. Um, scenic check will allow patrons to check out 100 items. So if a scenic patron goes to a different library that allows you to check out 20 items and they try to check out 100, they're going to be told you can't do that. And that's because the checkout library has different policies and we would just have to teach the patrons that's the way it was. And we would could get around that. Well, you have auto renewal, so yes, the charge, the fines would start. So that is that is a thing that would that would have that would happen. And that would be the only time that um, fines could be could cross boundaries like that would be with auto renewal. Something else that can happen that really is tangential, I don't know if it's that important, is a patron could choose a different uh, pickup location for holds. So a scenic patron could put something on hold and say, well, I'm going to be over in by Cass County when that's is going to show up. So I want to pick it up there. So that well, can and, happen too. And potentially then avoid fines by going to a fine-free Yes. I'm going to send it to a fine free library all the time so that it's under their rules. Um, yeah, so there's no fines. And I I don't know that that's such a bad thing if a, if worrying about fines is a right. barrier to right. checking out items. You know, I can't get books for my kids or I can't get the latest Nora Roberts to read for myself. Uh, because I'm afraid I won't get it back on time and I can't afford to pay a fine. So I'll have it sent to a library that doesn't charge fines. So I don't have that hanging over my head. Is that such a bad thing? I know, I know we like justice. And I am irritated too when a patron pays their fines down to one cent below our fine threshold. But I don't know. I don't know if that's something we need to get worked up about. That's my opinion. Well, I have one other issue um, with reciprocal borrowing. Our patron, a Cass County patron, went into another library and their library staff, um, they were on the Cass County card, they were blocked because of fines and the other library renewed those items to unblock them and then check out. That was concerning to Cass County. <laughs> Nobody should ever be renewing something that's already gone to bills. Yeah, that's that's a staff education thing. Yeah, I'm going to chime in and say that's not really a reciprocal. That's just a mistake. Um, that's 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 just something that I mean, it this broaches common courtesy between libraries. I don't think we would want to have that done with our patrons, and we certainly shouldn't do it with others. So I'm going to I'm going to call that just a, 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 an unforced error there. I think that's a problem. And I hope no one is doing that. Um, if it happens from time to time, I hope you're forgiving because it does happen if you if you are busy at the desk. But um, yeah, I wouldn't I don't necessarily see that as tied into the reciprocal issue. I want to follow up on one thing Diane said, and that is that um, there is a lot of discussion around um, making some changes globally to the um, evergreen, um, the way it works. And I, we're not going to make any changes without a lot of discussion, a lot of um, warning, but we're going to explore some things and do some testing on our test server and see how things behave. But I wanted everyone to know that we're pursuing this to, to try and find a common understanding of what the rules are in our catalog, how they behave, and how how we can benefit from them. That's really what this is about. So I hope everybody's on board with that. We're trying to find the best possible solution for everybody. Um, and that may require at some point changing some global settings in our catalog. We will not make those changes until you're well informed that everyone agrees and there's a consensus though. Well, and I only think this is going to come up these situations are going to come up more and more as more libraries join Missouri Evergreen. Um, more libraries that are closer together to where someone might actually be in Cass County's 
jurisdiction, so to speak, but they are they live closer to a trails library or or you know that's just for us. But as more and more libraries come in, this is going to be something that we are going to have to address um, just because of proximity of the incoming libraries. I'm I'm working at a couple of our branches right now, filling in till we get a new manager, and I'm I'm here in the Herman branch right now, and uh, somebody came in just at the end of last week, who lives in the Missouri River Regional District, but um, she is actually closer to our Scenic Herman branch than she is to a Missouri River Regional branch, mm -hmm. and. Um, Missouri River Regional is not a, a Missouri Evergreen Library yet, but she came in here. We have a reciprocal agreement with them, so I gave her a scenic card, and she'll be coming in here more than she will to her home library. So that's exactly what Rhonda said, is we have 60 members now, and we're right next to each other. Does anybody else have something that they would like to add? Okay, well, I'm sure, like Mickey said, um, we're going to be working on it, looking more closely at settings and how we can make this work um, equitably for everybody. Um, and like he said, nothing is going to change immediately. Um, there will be plenty of notice if something does change and or when something does change. All right, so moving on to old business, um, purging patron counts, account recommendations. Truthfully, I just was so busy in the last month that I haven't really um, got that done. So um, I am going to be trying to email the circulation committee with more finalized wording for that and so that you guys can chime in. So look for that, you know, sometime, although my next two weeks I'm training somebody almost every day. So I'm going to try and get it in there as quickly as um, I can so that we can have that ready by next month. And so I just freely admit I let that slide. Um, the next thing on the old business is just a that uh, reminder of the Simple Reports intro video that Equinox produced. Um, so I've put the link in there again. Um, many of us went to Tony's um, reports committee meeting this month, um, and in it, he has prepared a um, set of slides that go into Simple Reporter in more detail. So here is, again, the link that you can get to that so that you can see um, those slides. I believe I saw that the actual output has now been turned on. Is that correct? For a while, you could, you could run the report, but you couldn't see what the output was. And so Tony has... Um, got with Equinox and now I believe that's open so that you can can actually see results from that test um, server. So if, if that's helpful to you, get in there and, and go for it. Um, is there anything else that someone would like to bring up for discussion? Has anybody seen any huge changes in the in the updated test server for circulation? I looked at it and I didn't see a lot of big changes. You can see the checkout workstation um, in the circulation history. And there was one other thing. Oh, um, when you register a patron, you can select a different language if the patron has a different language. Those are the only two things I saw on the circulation side. Is Am I missing something? I don't know. I, I noticed in 3.8, but I think it was in the, the update that we just had in 3.8 that hopeless holds are now going to reset if um, that hold becomes available again. If I mean, that item becomes available again. In the past, once it got into that hopeless hold um, list, it was there forever. There was nothing you can do about it. Um, 
And now I believe that's been fixed to where if that the item in that bib record comes back into the system and is available, it'll reset. And so I saw that, but. I can't think, you know, there's probably something, but I'm like you, Diane, I read through it and I didn't see a whole lot that had changed. Yeah, and I poked around in the test server when they updated it too. So I'm I'm prepared to tell the staff that they can breathe a huge sigh of relief because there won't be a lot of changes to circulation. Yeah. Okay, so I don't hear anybody else bringing up any other um, concerns. No, just one quick reminder that um, um, we are entertaining um, session uh, topics for the users conference in April. And so if anyone wants to funnel that information to you, Rhonda, or you, Diane, or to me, um, I'm very interested in hearing from membership about what sort of topics you'd like covered. We have a number of breakout sessions planned for the users conference. It is uh, both an in-person and um, a remote event. So if you can attend in person in Columbia, that's fine. You can attend online. It will be recorded for the most part. So in these sessions are going to be informational, 45 minute kinds of uh, quick hits. So if there's something you want to talk about um, that's CERC related, um, it's a good place to um, tell, tell me about it, tell us about it about it so we can get it scheduled for the users conference. So Mickey, can you go ahead? Did you say the dates and I just missed it? Sorry, you know, it is a, a the users conference is in Columbia, April the 13th and 14th. That's Thursday and Friday. It'll be all day Thursday and half day Friday. So April 13th and 14th, that's the first Missouri Evergreen Users Conference. It will be an on-site event, but there'll be lots of um, Zoom participation for those who can't come. Uh, it should be a, a very enjoyable uh, opportunity to interact with your fellow Missouri Evergreen members. All right. That'll be a fun day getting to see people that we normally just see online. So, all right. If there's nothing else to come before the committee, I'm going to entertain a motion to close. Nobody wants to close. I'll make that motion. Brian. There you go. <laughs> Is there a second? <laughs> I don't know if I can. I'll second. There you go. Very good. All right. Have a wonderful afternoon and we'll meet next month. All right. Thank, Thank you, Rhonda. Rhonda. Mm -hmm. yep. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye. Take care, all.